when I first started doing Confused Matthew, I had planned on doing many more Star Trek Voyager reviews. It was actually one of my primary interests starting out. After my awful Star Trek Voyager Moments video, it was my intention to continue with that kind of analysis. Not exactly reviewing the show episode by episode, but rather naming off where I thought the show continued to stick one foot in its own mouth and the other foot up its own ass. But around this time, my esteemed colleague SF Debris began reviewing the show in its entirety, and after seeing just a few reviews from him, I was hooked. And it quickly became apparent that I really didn't have to say anything about this show anymore. Chuck's keen eye for quality, or lack thereof, in the show, and a hilarious sense of humor seemed sufficient on the internet. That's not to say that two people can't give their own opinion on the same work, Chuck and I have reviewed a lot of the same material over the years, there just didn't seem to be much urgency at the time to my reviewing the show since he had fulfilled that need so completely. But with the advent of Netflix, I have had the chance to refresh my memory about what made the show so awful. Not that I ever really forgot, but it's been foremost on my mind in the last few months, and with me running low on movies to review, now seems like as good a time as any to start talking about the show. A lot of what you're going to hear is actually from a few discarded scripts around 2007 when I first started out, but these observations have been with me ever since I sat down in front of my TV at 14 years of age, gazed upon this brand new Star Trek show, and started throwing up. Before I begin this intro, I want to give a quick mention to something real fast. Uh, as I said, SF Debris, of whom I am a ginormous fan, is very well known for his Star Trek reviews. And as I am told that he and I share much of the same audience, I realize the comparisons are bound to be drawn. Let me just say that if you think his reviews are better than mine, hell, I'm not going to argue with you, I love the shit out of his reviews. But if you ever find a spot where his views and mine differ with one another, Please don't take this as a versus kind of thing where I'm trying to override his opinion or anything. Just take this for what it is. Another person giving his two cents on the same material. <sighs> Star Trek Voyager. God does it suck. I've been racking my brain as to where to start with these reviews, and I've decided to start with the first thing on the show that I thought they actually did right. This is interesting because it also went on to result in what I consider to be the biggest mistake the show ever made, and that, in my opinion, they were never able to recover from. And with that lead-in, I will be beginning a review of the episode, Meld, and the one shining ray of light that was snuffed out far too soon, Lone Suitor. We'll see why in the review. But before I review Meld, I want to go over what it is that made the Voyager characters suck so much, and why this character stood out for me, whereas the rest of the characters just fumbled. Actually, the problems with the characters are almost identical with the problems of the Star Trek Voyager universe itself. I remember once in an SF Debris review, Chuck saying something to the effect that Voyager was a show that needed to remind you every five minutes that you're in the future. I would add to that that this is a show that has to remind you every five minutes that the characters are the race that they are, and that has to remind you every five minutes that this is the Star Trek universe. They do this to such an overwhelming extent that the universe didn't even feel like a real lived-in place in Star Trek Voyager. It felt like an artificial place that was constantly referencing itself. Uh, you know what I always say, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the warp core. Okay, unless the original saying was, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the oven, that doesn't even make any goddamn motherfucking sense. Who and why the fuck would anyone be in a warp core? And then you say, well, why didn't they just make it, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the engine room? But no, that's my point, because see, lots of things have engine rooms, only the Star Trek universe has warp cores, so there, it's the Star Trek universe, so it's get out of the warp core. See how Star Trek-y that sounds? Fuck you, I'm not stupid. Write better. But then I guess you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it phasers. And then there's the issue of race, which is by far one of the most irritating and simplistic aspects of this show for me. There's been some talk of Star Trek Voyager being racist, and I think that has a lot to do with how the writers and producers view race. Not just the real ones, but the Star Trek races as well. 
Remember in my awful Star Trek Voyager moments video when I commented that Seven of Nine was just saying race things in the episode Infinite Regress rather than being given actual characters to play? That, in a nutshell, is why the Star Trek Voyager characters suck. That's all they are. None of them have characters. Each and every one is just a walking racial stereotype. Each character and race in Star Trek Voyager is just a caricature of the species and culture that they are, and this is all the Star Trek Voyager production team knows how to do in the show. For example, every single time the Klingons are featured in Star Trek Voyager, the first thing they do is threaten the first person that happens to be in the room, and the second thing they do is try to fuck the first person that happens to be in the room. Why? Because those are Klingon things, right? And as we will see, not only will this become a common theme for all of the races on Star Trek Voyager, but throughout the course of the series, they will attempt to make everything a race. Even when those entities couldn't be less like a race, or it couldn't be more inappropriate to make them a race. This includes, but is not limited to, the Borg, the Q, and fucking holograms! Every main character they create is just a walking stereotype of what race they are, and this is enforced over and over again even when it makes absolutely no sense to their actual character. Don't believe me? Here, let me give you just the most basic example of this. This is going to seem like a small thing, and technically it is, but it's also very telling about the way the writers think about these characters when writing what they say and do. God, this pisses me off here. Let me, let me set the stage for you here. In the episode Renaissance Man, the Doctor lost his mobile emitter for reasons that I won't even go into. It's, it's, it's fucking retarded. And Seven comes in to pay him a visit. Since he's basically trapped in sickbay, he wants to hear all the news on what's going on on the ship. And Seven tells him that she had an altercation with Bolana Torres. The Doctor presses Seven to give him details about the encounter, and this is what she says. Taurus referred to me as an automaton. She also employed a series of profane Klingon insults. Shall I translate them for you? Let's hear this one more time so there's no misunderstanding here. She also employed a series of profane Klingon insults. Shall I translate them for you? When has Bolana Torres ever spoken in Klingon on this show? Has she even done it once? I think I remember her speaking in Klingon a few times when the circumstances were kinda weird, but in regular everyday conversation, this never happens. When having an argument with someone and devolving into one of her usual pathetic baby fits, Balana is much more likely to call someone an idiot than a pitak. What's this? The medical report on Lieutenant Carey. Lieutenant Carey is an idiot! See? And the reason that is, is because the language Klingon isn't a language that this character regularly speaks. The only time Klingons in Star Trek speak Klingon is when that's their language and they accidentally slip in and out of it every once in a while. You dare talk to me like that? You pathetic mock dog! Balana Torres does not use Klingon insults. Balana Torres speaks Fucking English! But to the writers of Voyager, she isn't a character. She's just an amalgam of racial traits. So when we hear about a conversation she had off screen, they naturally write that she said Klingon things. Fuck you, I'm not stupid. Write better. And this is just the smallest example of what is indicative of the way these people write these characters. They're all just walking stereotypes of what race they are, and when there is no race to exploit with them, they're just blank and wooden. And yes, this goes equally and especially for Seven of Nine as well. I remember around 1998 hearing about Seven of Nine for the first time by fans and listening to all the complete overstatements about how good her character supposedly was. Don't get me wrong, she is ever so slightly better than the rest, but we're talking about a show that sets the bar at Chakotay. So when you bring a new character into the mix, you really can't help but go just slightly up from that. 
Nevertheless, her character development and integration with the crew was just as rushed and sloppy as the rest of the show, and she was still, for the most part, just a walking series of bored catchphrases and tropes. And then there's Neelix. Oh, I'm sorry, I put a picture of the Doctor up there because later in the series, he does become another Neelix. In my opinion, every single strategy they had when developing the Doctor was the wrong one. And over the course of this show, he became an insufferable irritant rather than a well-rounded character. No, I'm afraid I thought all the characters on Voyager sucked, I'm sorry to say. They're all blank, they're all wooden, and they all have more to say about catchphrases and racial stereotypes than they do with anything that would give them a real personality. There is a certain logic to your logic. Okay, we get it. He's the Vulcan. Guilt is irrelevant. Okay, we get it. She's the Borg. Most Betazoids can sense other people's emotions. I can't even sense my own. Holy crap! A deep, complicated, multi-dimensional character that isn't just a stereotype of his own race? Yeah. I can see why they had to kill him off. And this brings me to the first thing on Voyager that ever gave me hope, and eventually became the first thing on Voyager that royally pissed me off. Way above the Doctor, over and above Seven of Nine, Suter was the most interesting character Star Trek Voyager ever created. And he was only in three fucking episodes. As I said, I won't always be reviewing specific Star Trek Voyager episodes, but with the review of Meld, I hope to explain how I feel that this show eventually got off on the right foot, and then quickly stepped on it a few paces in. Why did you kill him, Mr. Souter? No reason. So this episode begins with a kind of conflict that should have been present the whole time on the show. One of the crew members has been found dead, and what's more, this man has been murdered. The Doctor confirms this through an analysis from the computer, which seems a bit redundant because for all intents and purposes, the Doctor is just the computer, but that's a subject I will go into a lot more in later reviews. But for now, a killer is apparently on the loose on Voyager, which requires the worst security officer in the history of Starfleet to begin an investigation. I'm serious, this guy can't stop children from taking over the ship, but I'll get to that in later episodes too. Now, when I say that Voyager needed more conflicts like this, I'm not necessarily saying that they needed someone to die in every episode, but where Tuvok's investigation leads him plays right into the problem of integrating a Maquis crew with the Starfleet crew, and it also gives Janeway a conflict that you would think she would have to deal with more often on this show. We'll talk about all that later on. As Tuvok discusses the details of the murder, Torres reports that Suter was the only person in engineering when Darwin, the murdered crewman, was on duty. And this is just a great setup for the character as Chakotay immediately reacts to hearing Suter's name. This description allows us to have a very clear picture of who this guy is supposed to be before we even see him. Something wrong? No, not really. I've just never been comfortable with Suter, that's all. It's not like he ever did anything wrong, it's just... As a Maquis, he did what he had to do a little too well. As in? As in killing Cardassians. I don't recall observing anything unusual about Mr. Suter's behavior while I was on your ship. You weren't with him in battle. There was something in his eyes. Maybe he had something personal against Cardassians. Sometimes I had to pull him back, stop him from going too far. So now we have a very clear picture of who we're supposed to be meeting later on, but in a very rare instance, Tuvok actually brings up a pretty good point after Jakote is done describing Suter. I find it curious that none of this was included in your initial crew evaluation, Commander. I don't put down hunches or bad feelings in my crew evaluations, Lieutenant. A Vulcan should appreciate that. Considering the fact that your Maquis crew included malcontents, outlaws, and mercenaries, I believe it would have been appropriate. 
I wasn't going to make it harder for any of them here. Oh, wow, look at that! Actual conflict on Star Trek Voyager. What do you know? It is possible. And what makes this exchange work is the fact that both of these characters made some pretty good points. Chakotay should have been more upfront about who they led into the Maquis and who could potentially be a threat to the rest of the Starfleet crew. But at the same time, Chakotay does have to look out for his people, and making the transition as easy as possible for them was probably a wise course of action. Meld was the 32nd episode of Star Trek Voyager, and they're only just now getting around to addressing conflicts like this, which is yet another reason that this episode got my attention. So now it's time for Tuvok to sit down and talk with Suter, and even after the build-up they had given him in the previous scene, I was still actually surprised by this. He really is a quiet and unassuming guy. Did you kill Crewman Darwin? No. No, I barely knew him. You know, just because I'm a Maquis doesn't make me a killer. For all intents and purposes, Suter seemed downright normal. A little irritated that Tuvok was singling him out, but no more so than any other Maquis would have been. Suter came across as so normal here that the first time I saw this episode, I thought maybe they were going to bring in a few other people for questioning and have the audience try and guess who done it. It didn't seem overly obvious that Suter was the guilty party here. But, as it turns out, he is. The computer, uh, I mean the doctor, presents incontrovertible evidence that Suter killed Darwin. And when presented with this evidence... Suter reacts in a way that, quite frankly, I didn't expect. There is not a hint of pride here, nor of satisfaction. Suter reacts in what I can only describe as shame, as if someone just exposed a part of himself that he did not want revealed. But here's the interesting thing, it's not because he was afraid of the repercussions. We'll learn flat out that Suter is not afraid of being punished for this, even if that punishment is death. What Suter fears is anyone finding out that he has this inside of him, and that's what makes this character so interesting, because his dilemma is so damned complicated. This is not something that Suter wants to do. The killing, I mean. This isn't even something that Suter likes to do. It seems to be a part of himself that he would rather be rid of if he could. A part of himself that he feels ashamed of, but that he just can't escape. This is a great conflict in my opinion because it's so tremendously complicated, both for Suter and for everyone else. It's not like, say, the boring, watered-down Seven of Nine conflict where she eventually feels bad for assimilating people, who cares? It's not her fault. She was assimilated. She couldn't help what she did. And before you compare this to Locutus and ask me if I think that that was a big bucket of who cares, it wasn't the same thing. The Locutus conflict was all about what they did to Picard as a Starfleet officer and as a man. Picard already had a moral character that they robbed him of, and they took his moral compass and humanity and positively raped it. Seven didn't have that, as she was only a child. The only thing Seven of Nine was actually robbed of was a childhood, and that isn't even made a central conflict for her character. I'm sorry, but Seven of Nine's internal conflict sucked on this show. She was a Borg. It wasn't her fault. This is Suter's fault, completely and inescapably, and thus this is a real internal conflict. This pain is his to bear, and his alone. And the only question now is what to do with him. Now that the jig is up, Suter confesses without hesitation. And here we see such a gradual change in the character. He's still the same guy we saw in the interrogation room, but now he comes across as though there are no more walls he's putting up. His vocal inflections become colder and more detached from his emotions. There's something about him that seems liberated, but also something that seems to have given up. Ah, uh, I used a two kilo coil spanner. He was sitting at the impulse system control panel. Didn't even look up when I moved in behind him and I swung the spanner as hard as I could. Crewman, I suggest you speak to counsel. 
There was practically no blood. I was surprised at that. Tuvok, however, only has one question for him. Why did you kill him, Mr. Suter? No reason. That is not a satisfactory answer. You must have had some motive. I didn't like the way he looked at me. Suffice it to say that this, I didn't like the way he looked at me defense doesn't set very well with Tuvok, and so he tries to place a motive on these events. Having exhausted all conventional explanations, Tuvok then tries to rule out psychosis by having the doctor run Suter's brain through the ship's crazy detector. Doctor, is it possible that Mr. Suter is psychotic? I doubt it. Kess, call up his genetic profile. The neurogenetic markers are normal. There's no tendency toward bipolar disorder. So he's not insane per se. As someone who suffers from bipolar disorder, I'm gonna let that slide. And just to go a bit off topic for a second, contrary to popular meme, the definition of insanity is not doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. That would actually be more the definition of optimism more than insanity. This was thought to be a quip by Albert Einstein, although even that is questionable, who was a great theoretical physicist, but knew precisely nothing about psychology. In the United States, insanity isn't even a medical term at all, only a legal one. And it's true that a great many deranged serial killers did not meet the criterion for the insanity plea. So, what's going on here? Why is Suter killing? What is he doing this for? Let's do Tuvok's job for a second and analyze this based on everything that we've seen in the episode. Is Suter killing for satisfaction? No. Or at least if he is, it's not granting him any. We've heard from Suter again and again that he derives no long-term satisfaction from the act of killing, which is why he feels he has to do this again and again. In fact, according to Suter, he feels nothing after taking a life. He feels empty doing this. So is he doing this for self-glorification? Absolutely not. Look at Suter's reaction when he was caught. He was horrified that someone found out what he was doing, humiliated even. He reacted as if someone found out something horrible and embarrassing about him, a secret that he's been trying to hide his whole life. And the only reason he finally came clean at all is because there was no avoiding the truth of his guilt. He didn't brag, he didn't boast. He is not doing this for self-glorification. So if it's not satisfaction or self-glorification, then what is it? The way I see it, Suter is killing because he feels he must. Why he feels he must seems to be as much a mystery to Suter as it does to us, but he thinks that killing might bring him some peace about whatever it is that eats away from him, only it never does, but there's always that drive to try. Therefore, it seems to me that Suter is killing because he has a psychological compulsion to kill. So why is this not an acceptable explanation for Tuvok? Unfortunately, the answer is, it's a storytelling necessity. Part of this episode is about Tuvok grappling with something that he can't understand. And this is one of many things that I just don't like about Star Trek Voyager's approach to storytelling. So much of it is this artificial. A character's journey just can't go forward organically in Voyager. It's all at the service of what they need to have happen in a particular episode. Voyager's strategy, for the most part, is we need this reaction from this character in this situation, when it should always be what reaction would this situation get from this character. So for as good as the episode is in presenting us with a new and interesting character, Tuvok's story is only half as good, but it does get better as the episode goes on. As for Suter, there is a parallel here that stood out for me the first time I saw this. Now, I did a bit of looking into this, and I cannot find any statement on the part of the writers that confirms this, but to me, there seems to be an obvious parallel between Suter and the main character in Edgar Allan Poe's The Telltale Heart. For those of you who haven't read the story, it is told from a first-person perspective, that being the perspective of the killer himself, or herself, it's never actually specified. In any case, the killer, as he or she is telling the story, spends the first few paragraphs and many sentences thereafter trying to convince the reader that he or she is not insane. 
that everything they did was of sound mind and planned in a sane and reasoned way, and that no madman could have been as methodical as he or she was. Likewise, this episode tries to convince the viewer that Souter is not doing this out of mere insanity. We've seen that Souter didn't have anything against Darwin at all, and that his only motivation for killing him when he was forced to come up with one was that he didn't like the way Darwin looked at him. So what was the motivation for the killer in the Telltale Heart? Let's read the first passage that describes this. He had never wronged me. He had never given me insult. For his gold I had no desire. I think it was his eye. Yes, it was this. He had the eye of a vulture, a pale blue eye with a film over it. Whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold, and so by degrees, very gradually, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man, and thus rid myself of the eye forever. In other words, he didn't like the way he looked at him. Now, as I said, I can't find anything that confirms that this was an intentional parallel, but this is just another reason why I like this character so much. We're talking about things that are on the level of Poe. So after ruling out crazy genes as the cause of Suter's murders, the doctor tries to convince Tuvok that maybe Suter just has impulses that he can't control. It's another point in the episode that they're trying to hit home, that emotional instability and violent behavior aren't that cut and dry. They're very complicated, and sometimes people just can't control themselves. Interesting, considering later in the episode, they easily turn Tuvok's control off with the flick of a switch, but hey, this show sucks. Still, the conversation in and of itself has value at first, but then it gets a little strange as they completely oversell it. Just watch the scene for yourself. It really ends up coming off like the doctor is saying, listen Tuvok, you're really not getting this. There's nothing wrong with Suter at all. He just kills people for the way they look at him. Tuvok remains unsatisfied, however, and so he proposes a mind meld with the unstable killer. I know. I think it's a great idea too. But here's the interesting part. Suter doesn't resist this in the slightest. When told that he might gain some of Tuvok's control in doing this, he leaps at the opportunity. Which reinforces the fact that Suter doesn't want to be like this. In a way, he is just as much a victim of himself as his actual victims have been. The meld goes ahead, and it turns out that, surprise, surprise, Tuvok didn't learn shit from this experience except what Suter already told him, that he simply is compelled to be violent and kill. And now we get to the issue of what to do with him. Obviously execution is out of the question, and so the next best thing is solitary confinement for the rest of his trip. In the first tip-off that something's wrong with Tuvok, he immediately protests and actually suggests an execution, saying that giving Suter the comfort of his own quarters is hardly a good punishment for murder. There are a number of audience opinions about Janeway's decision here, and I think that's a good thing. It's another reason why I like this episode so much. We're supposed to be thinking about what the right thing to do is. That's one of the things that Star Trek is for. So I'll tell you what my opinion on this punishment is, but I'm not saying that this is even the right one. It's just another part of the debate. In my opinion, sentencing Suter to a lifetime of solitary confinement is no mercy, and it's no small thing. Ask any inmate who has actually endured solitary confinement for any length of time how easy it is. Even when given books and a TV in there, most of them go batty within the first couple of days. Just imagine spending an entire year in your room. If we go by solitary confinement rules, you get one hour a day for recreation. The rest of the time, you're in there. No leaving, no seeing anything but those four walls. And after trying to wrap your head around having to endure that for a year, now imagine spending the rest of your life in there. What Janeway is suggesting here is actually worse than what Suter would get in a Federation penal colony. At least Suter would get to see the freaking sun out there. But there's something even more interesting in what's going on here. Something that should have been addressed long before now on the show. What to do with Suter shouldn't even be Janeway's fucking problem in the first place. She didn't bring Suter on as a member of the crew. 
Chakotay did. Now Janeway is finding herself responsible for someone else's mistake. Once again, Meld was the 32nd episode of the series, and they're only just now getting around to dealing with conflicts like this. But what a conflict it is. With regard to the crew in this episode, anyone who complains about Janeway's decision is a fucking dickhead. She shouldn't even have to make this call in the first place. After dismissing Janeway's idea of solitary confinement, Tuvok is having a very difficult time controlling his emotions, and so he takes a trip to the mess hall to try and get himself under control when Neelix starts to irritate him as usual. Which of course leads to one of Chuck Sonnenberg's wet dreams. But surprise, because it was a holodeck simulation all along. You know what's really funny about this? Really, just think about this for a minute. This whole thing was supposed to be a fake-out. The audience is supposed to believe that Tuvok is really killing Neelix here, so that when it's revealed we can all go, Oh, it was just a holodeck simulation, you got me. But the only way that we could actually believe that this is real in the first place is if we believe that this really is Neelix. So, what they're admitting here is that Neelix really is this obnoxious. This is not the least bit out of character. This is just him. God, what the hell were they thinking with this fucking character? So after this, Tuvok pays a visit to Suter, and once again, we have a great portrayal here. Once again, he's still the same guy that we saw in the interrogation room. He still has all that violence under the surface, only now he's more controlled and more centered. Tuvok, on the other hand, is practically falling apart, slowly but surely, which is why these two characters work so damn well together. This is a moment of bonding for them, but it's over something horrible, something that neither of them understand very well. Neither of these characters wants to be violent, but now Tuvok understands what Suter has understood his whole life, that the compulsion to kill is not about what you want to do, it's about what you feel you must do. This show tried to create a bond between Tuvok and Kess, who I like by the way, by having Tuvok teach her about mental discipline, but that whole thing was a bust. The two characters basically just talk psychobabble at one another, and neither of them was really learning anything from the other. Certainly not anything that would help them grow as characters. That could not be further from the truth when it comes to this. Tuvok and Suter are the only two people in the universe who can understand what the other is going through, and they need each other now more than ever. Eventually Tuvok just says, fuck it, I need to do something real, so he goes into his quarters and smashes up the place. Janeway eventually comes in, and we get the writing staff's usual strategy of trying to show us how badass Janeway is by making her act stupid and foolhardy. I would advise you not to enter, Captain. Please, do not come any closer. Do not jump out that window. You motherfucker. Once they have Tuvok on the medical bed, they go into his brain and shut his ability to control his emotions off. Apparently, to the Voyager writing staff, the brain is like a big computer, and the stuff in the brain are just like programs that can be uninstalled and reinstalled with ease. While in reality, I don't deny that you could probably remove things from the brain to make someone's behavior different, it would result in a thousand unintended consequences and side effects. It's called lobotomizing, but not here. Here, you can just set someone's self-control to the on or off position. Kinda makes you wonder why Vulcans aren't lining up around the block to have this procedure done if you can just flip an emotional control switch so easily. Kinda makes you wonder why they bother with all that meditation and self-discipline at all if it's as easy as pressing a few buttons. Kinda makes you wonder why they don't just flip Suter's crazy switch off if they can do things like this so easily, but you have to remember, this show sucks. I'm sorry, I had them disable your telepathic abilities too. Good lord, don't they need Tuvok's permission to do any of this? 
They're turning his brain into a freaking puppet for crying out loud! So, Tuvok is both emotional and unstable now, and it goes about as well as you'd expect. The idea for this cure is that they're just gonna let him be that way for a while, and this will all fix itself. Makes sense to me. And of course, no guards or restraints are necessary, because otherwise they couldn't have Tuvok do the things. Tuvok escapes and naturally intends to kill Suter. Suter is not concerned about himself, however. He is genuinely concerned about what this will do to Tuvok. He, of all people, knows what taking a life will mean. We both know that I am prepared to die. But are you prepared to kill? It needs to be done. To release your violent impulses? To serve justice. Justice or vengeance. Understand one thing, Tuvok. I can promise you this will not silence your demons. If you can't control the violence, the violence controls you. Be prepared to yield your entire being to it. To sacrifice your place in civilized life for you will no longer be a part of it, and there's no return. <laughs> I seek no return. Of course, you would not be able to live with yourself. Then we are both to die. Tuvok is unable to bring himself to kill Suter, however, and he eventually goes back to normal. But both these two men have now shared an experience that has challenged who they are and what they know. An experience that could have propelled the series into greatness if they hadn't completely abandoned the one thing in the series that could possibly have done so. Meld gave us a good episode. It was flawed, but it was good. But more importantly, it gave us a great character. I don't believe they ever intended Suter to be a full-fledged member of the crew the same way that Seven of Nine was. Like Guinan or maybe Reg Barkley, I think he was only ever intended to be a reoccurring, once-in-a-while type of character. They had a great excuse for that, too. Since he was sentenced to solitary confinement, it would explain why, in a ship full of only 150 people, we don't see him very often. They can pull him out at need and stick him back in whenever they want. There's just never been a character like Suter before on Star Trek. He's a Betazoid, a race almost never used on Star Trek, he has a darkness in him that no other Star Trek character ever has, and he has a complicated personal conflict that isn't the least bit easy to resolve. But more than that, Suter made Tuvok's character better. Up until now, Tim Russ had been doing a very good job portraying a convincing Vulcan but there wasn't much character that went along with that race. Tuvok would occasionally walk into a room, say something about logic, and then not be able to defend the ship against being taken over by teenagers. There was nothing going on with him. Meld was the first time I actually said to myself, this character is going through something that's challenging him, something that's making him grow. This could have been the start of both these characters' journeys, and even with Suter only being a reoccurring character, he could have given the series that push into something challenging. For example, remember that episode where the crew had to be put in stasis and only Seven of Nine and the Doctor were awake and running the ship? Every time I see that episode, I always wonder, what if Suter was in this situation instead of Seven of Nine? I actually wondered that a lot with a lot of Seven of Nine episodes, but particularly this one. This would have been a real test of what he does when he has no guidance other than what he's learned from Tuvok. Sadly, Suter would only appear in two more episodes, one ending the second season and the other beginning the third. Ultimately, he would be killed defending the ship from the Kazon. The only good news is that every scene he's in is a damn good one, and that conflict I mentioned with replacing Seven of Nine with Suter almost happens in these episodes. Suter and the Doctor are the only two people left on the ship, and they're the only ones who can defend it. There comes a scene in one of these episodes where the two are planning on how to retake the ship, and Suter stops and says to the Doctor, I'm gonna have to kill some of them. I remember hearing that for the first time and going, oh shit, he is. Damn, all that hard work, all that striving to center himself, 
and it could be torn down in the name of trying to do something good for the ship. I also wondered about that parallel I mentioned with regard to Poe. Let's say that Suter gets better and becomes a stable member of the crew. What happens when he finally realizes what he did to crewman Darwin and his family? When he finally feels remorse for the life that he stole and the lives that he ruined? What happens when Suter finally hears the beating of his hideous heart? That's the kind of thing that this character could have consistently contributed to the show. So why was he killed off? Well, originally he was supposed to live, and the decision to kill him was very last minute. The character was created by Michael Piller, who was on his way out the door when Voyager began their third season. So when the decision to kill Suter was made, he understandably had no reason to fight for him because the show wasn't really going to be his problem anymore. The actual decision to kill Suter was made at the last minute by Jerry Taylor, who didn't like the character even when he was first introduced. This perfectly demonstrates the difference between these two writers. I'm not saying this is the case with everything that they write, but generally speaking, Michael Piller likes to write stories that are complicated and challenging. And generally speaking, Jerry Taylor likes to tell stories that are stupid and easy. That's why when she was in charge of the later seasons, Voyager became so stupid and so easy. That's not to say that Taylor is a bad writer exactly, I've just always found that she works better when collaborating with someone rather than trying to do something on her own. So she basically wanted Suter gone because she didn't like him and she didn't really know how to write for him. In Michael Piller's own words regarding Suter's death, It's a real wipeout. Jerry never cared for Suter and had no interest in developing him any further, so there was no point in keeping him alive, and a dramatic arc is fully realized by having his death occur at the end of Part 2. He heroically sacrifices himself for the ship. Now, I'll give it that. Suter at least had a satisfying and appropriate conclusion. It just came much too soon and for no good reason. Jerry Taylor's statements were to the following effect. Although, please keep in mind, this isn't an actual direct quote from anyone. This comes from the Star Trek wiki page. The decision to have Suter killed was made because the writers couldn't see how he could really be redeemed, and he was simply too difficult to integrate with the other characters believably and well. This excuse really pisses me off. Let's start with the first point, that they couldn't see how Suter could really be redeemed. Excuse me, but isn't that for us to decide? Isn't that issue precisely the kind of conflict that would have made that character work in the first place? And even if he can't really be redeemed, is there not value in that story as well? Let's say that Suter spends the rest of his life trying to atone for what he did. Let's say that he slowly and gradually begins to help the crew, help himself, try to make everything right. Is that really enough to atone for the cold-blooded murder of so many people? Aren't these the difficult kinds of questions we're supposed to be asking ourselves in a Star Trek show? Isn't this what Star Trek is all about in the first place? And to the second point, that they felt that it was too difficult to integrate him into the rest of the crew? This part really gets under my skin. As a writer, if you just straight up can't make something work, if you honestly don't know how to pull something off, I'm not going to hold that against you, and it probably is better not to try if you legitimately don't know how to do this. But to say that you're giving up because it was too difficult is just a cop-out. You can't tell me that making Suter interact with the crew is any more complicated than making a Borg do it, yet they managed to do that just fine with Seven of Nine. If they honestly tried and they just couldn't make this work, fine. But let's be honest, as soon as Pillar was out of the picture, they didn't even try. I just don't like hearing that they gave up on this guy because it was too hard. You're a writer. It's supposed to be hard. Art is challenging. Or at least, good art is. So let's be honest. They got rid of Suter because Jerry Taylor didn't like him. Naturally, Taylor likes things that are easy. And Suter, in the conflict that came with him, was miles away from easy.